Hello and welcome to Distillations, extracts from the past, present, and future of chemistry. I'm Mayor Rindy. Do you hear that? That's the sound of breakfast. On today's show, we'll learn why everything is better with butter, and we'll visit an Alaskan bakery to learn the science of sourdough. That's all coming up on today's episode of Distillations. First up today, a bit of business. We'd like to welcome Jennifer Dionisio to the Distillations team. She's our new assistant producer. We also have to say goodbye to our executive producer, Audra Wolf. She's moving on to other projects, but we'll hear from her one more time later in today's program. Now, we start the show with our idea of the perfect breakfast. A cup of coffee, a glass of orange juice, some fresh baked bread, and homemade jam. We realize the chemistry behind these culinary treats might not be the first thing you think about in the morning, so we'll break it down for you, starting with the sweet taste of fruit preserves. Home canners have their own tips and tricks for getting the consistency and flavor of their jams and jellies just right, and we have the chemical agent that makes it all possible. Jennifer Dionisio has more. Connoisseurs of homemade fruit preserves know jams and jellies can range from firm and jiggly to runny and loose. The amount of firmness is primarily determined by one thing, pectin. Pectin is a polysaccharide that occurs naturally in plant cell walls, especially in unripe or pithy fruit. Citrus rinds are particularly high in pectin, so are apples. Since the 1920s, pectin has been commercially available as a liquid or powder that can be added directly to food to make it gel. Like all polymers, Individual pectin molecules are formed from long chains of smaller units that have bonded together. In pectin, the individual units are usually a ring of five carbon atoms plus one oxygen atom, with additional alcohol and carbonyl groups branching off the central ring. The rings are connected by oxygen. In some of the rings, the carbonyl groups have gone through an additional reaction and are said to be esterified. Depending on the number of esters, Pectins are classified as high ester or low ester. The high ester pectins are hydrophobic, shying away from water, while the low ester pectins can form ionic bonds with their surroundings. So how does all this translate to what I spread on my toast in the morning? The chemical structure of the pectin affects how the gel will set. If you're making a highly sweet or acidic jam or jelly, perhaps following your grandmother's strawberry jam recipe, you'll need to work with a high ester pectin. If, on the other hand, you're on a low-sugar diet but still crave a firm fruit spread, you'll need to look for a low-ester pectin, designed especially for making sugar-free preserves. Depending on what you're making, you might not need to add any pectin at all. Traditional fruit spreads made with apples, oranges, lemons, and plums contain enough natural pectin that there's no need to add any more. And even some low-pectin fruit, like strawberries and peaches, can produce firm jams if you make sure to throw in some underripe fruit. And that's it for The Chemical Agent. I'm Jennifer Dionisio. Jennifer Dionisio is Distillation's assistant producer. Every once in a while, it's nice to splurge on a breakfast of pancakes with a side of bacon, or fried eggs and ham. The rest of the time, though, most of us are trying to keep the fat to a minimum. That can be tricky for bakers who know that quality baked goods are loaded with butter. In today's Chemistry in Your Cupboard, Audra Wolf looks at whether low-fat options can still make a tasty pastry. Anyone who's ever made her own croissants or pie crust has probably been tempted to cut back on the butter. The recipe I typically use for pie crusts from the 1990s version of Joy of Cooking uses an entire stick of pure buttery goodness. Between the cost and the clogged arteries, it's tempting to use less, or to substitute canola oil, which has substantially less animal fat. But if you've ever tried that, you know it won't work. Substituting oil for butter and baked goods often leaves them misshapen, hard, and tasteless. What's going on? Let's start with the basics. Butter, with its high proportion of saturated fats, is a solid at room temperature. Oil, on the other hand, is a liquid. Although the amount of saturated fats in liquid oil varies, it's typically around 14%, about a quarter of that of butter. This very basic physical property makes a big difference in baking, especially in pastries. 
When you mix a batter or dough with oil, the oil is distributed evenly throughout. Butter, on the other hand, stays in little clumps that separate gluten strands from one another. When you bake the dough, the butter melts, leaving the flaky holes that we come to expect in a good croissant or crust. But butter as spacer is only part of the problem. Oil is pure fat. Butter, on the other hand, contains as much as 20% milk solids and water. The additional liquid keeps things moist, but the milk solids also add flavor and act as a browning agent. That's why you might get the texture you want if you use a flavorless solid shortening like vegetable-based Crisco, but the color and the flavor might be off. It's also why, if you insist on baking with oil rather than butter, you should reduce the amount of fat by about 25%. Another healthier option is to replace up to a quarter of your butter with flaxseed meal, which is loaded with omega-3 fatty acids. You'll need three parts flax for every one part butter, which also means that you'll need to add more moisture to compensate for the additional solids. Honestly, your best bet for a truly tasty and well-formed baked good is to stick with pure butter. Or maybe eat an apple or a pear instead. I'm Audra Wolf. Audra Wolf is the former executive producer of Distillations. Have comments or questions about something you've heard in our show? Send your thoughts to distillations at kimheritage.org. You're listening to Distillations. I'm Mayor Rundi. Finally today, no breakfast is complete without a quality slice of bread. And no one knows that better than the folks at Rise and Shine Bakery up in Anchorage, Alaska. Rebecca Shear paid them a visit to learn how they make their classic sourdough. When you walk into Rise and Shine Bakery, there's a note. Go around through the garden and into the backyard to the bakery. All right, let's go to the bakery. You'd better not have a cold or allergies or anything that would keep you from noticing the smell. Hey there. Hello. How are you? It smells divine in here. We can't smell it anymore. Oh, you're missing out. <laughs> Tangy, toasty, almost beer-like. It's the scent of 100% whole wheat sourdough. And today, Allison Arians and Dan Schwartz are baking 500 loaves in the production kitchen they've built on to their Anchorage home. When I arrive, they're about to start shaping the bread. There's about 50 pounds of dough in that big plastic tub right there. And Dan's going to pour it out onto this big wooden shaping table. Shaping is one of the many steps the couple goes through each day. Here, let me put some flour down. Because baking 100% whole wheat sourdough isn't exactly a piece of, well, 100% whole wheat cake. It requires a lot of care and chemistry. If you think about why bread rises, it's because the yeast in the bread is actually producing carbon dioxide and making bubbles inside the gluten that's in the wheat. So, um, sorry, it's hard to talk and think at the same time and shake bread. Let's see if we can give her a hand here. See, Allison and Dan grind their own whole wheat flour. And when you mix this coarse stuff with the goopy sourdough starter, the pointy bran particles pop holes in the gluten bubbles. It's like if you were trying to blow a bubble with bubble gum, but you had all kinds of sand in your gum, it wouldn't blow a very nice bubble. Exactly, which is why Allison and Dan let the flour and starter hang out and get to know each other all night long. And that's called a pre-ferment because it's before the regular rising of the dough. It's just softening all that home ground flour. So that the gluten can absorb more of that carbon dioxide and the dough can expand and grow. The following morning, Dan puts the newly risen dough in the mixer. He mixes it for a few minutes. And then he lets it sit for 20 minutes or so, and that's called an auto-lease. It's a French term. It's basically letting the flour absorb the water before you then start to knead it to develop the gluten. And you want to develop the gluten, or strengthen it really, to increase the elasticity of the dough and make it less sticky for easier shaping. But before Allison and Dan can shape any loaves, they stash the dough in those big plastic tubs so it can rise again. See, when you make bread with commercial yeast, you can just open a new package and add whatever you need to ferment the dough's starches and produce CO2. But the wild yeast and sourdough starter need time to grow and multiply on their own. That's why Allison and Dan let the dough rise again for two hours. They punch it down, it rises, rises another, another hour, hour, and then we take it out, then we'll start shaping the loaves. Which, of course, is where we are now. But before the loaves can bake, they need to rise one last time in a process called proofing. So what we do is we put it in these little proofing racks that have steam and hot water in the bottom. So it's very humid, it's very warm, 
so that those little yeasties are as happy as they can possibly be. And when those yeasties are positively dancing for joy, Allison and Dan put the loaves in the oven. Right now? Yeah. You ready? Sure. Let's do it. They inject some steam to gelatinize the starches on the loaves' surface. See all the little droplets of steam on the pans? Making for a crunchier crust. And then... Can you hear that? Voila. That's a nice crusty crust. Thanks to a little culinary chemistry, you've got hot, fresh, 100% whole wheat sourdough. Which, even if you can't smell... It smells so good, and here I'm like freaking out. You guys can't smell this? No, I can't really smell it. <laughs> you can definitely taste. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. This is perfect. This yep. is this is perfect. It works. She said with her mouth full. <laughs> Suddenly craving carbs like you would not believe. I'm Rebecca Shear for Distillations. Rebecca Shear is a reporter with public radio station KTOO-FM in Juneau, Alaska. And that's it for this episode of Distillations. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Mia Lobel is our senior producer. Our associate producer is Victoria Indaviro, and our assistant producer is Jennifer Dionisio. Our theme music is composed and performed by Dave Kaufman. Additional music provided from the Podsafe Music Network. Check it out at music.podshow.com. Please tell us what you think about our program and send suggestions for future shows to distillations at chemheritage.org. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy.